Good day, everybody, and a very big welcome to all of those that have joined us. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is the, the Sustainable Lifestyles and Education Program, uh, looking at education for sustainable development. The Sustainable Lifestyles and Education Program, or SLE, is a global network uh, that supports the development of tools and resources for the uptake of sustainable lifestyles and addressing key global challenges. Education for sustainable development, as you will well know, is kind of supporting transformative, explorative action and essentially learning our way into what is not yet there. The sustainable lifestyle and education uh, projects and resources include the Global Search for Sustainable Schools, the Trust Fund projects, the Good Life Goals and the Anatomy of Action. The program is co-led by the Ministry of it of environment in Japan and the government of Sweden. Uh, today what we're going to work through is, uh, is an agenda that brings out your thoughts through the tool Mentimeter. We'll give an overview uh, of the kinds of, of projects that have been worked on uh, and particularly our notion of education for sustainable development. The video shares in graphic uh, form the work that, that's been happening in a number of different uh, SLE initiatives. We then have a great panel of people who've worked on some of these initiatives to deepen our insights. We'll have a Q&A uh, opportunity. We'll summarize uh, some of the key insights that have come out of our time together and chart a way forward together. Please note that we're using uh, Teams Live and that the session is being recorded. Uh, there's also a chat function available in the top right hand corner, the speech bubbles. We really invite you to use that to enter your questions and comments as we go through the session. We're now going to move over and use uh, Mentimeter to get some site insights of who's on the call with us at the moment. Uh, please use your browser uh, and go to www.menti.com and type in the code that you see there, 2033138, or just scan the QR code onto your phone and it'll open you immediately into the site. We've got two questions uh, in the Mentimeter that we're inviting you to respond to. Uh, the first one is really trying to get a sense of who's on the call with us and the kinds of sectors uh, that you represent. So yeah, please scan in the code and complete the questions. We are aware that there is a slight delay on information coming through on this site, so please keep going. Thank you. Right, and the second question will give us uh, some sense of what people have in mind when they think about sustainable development transformations. This notion of transformation is, as we will see, central to the new framework on education for sustainable development. There's no doubt that this kind of education needs to be disruptive. It needs to challenge the kind of current status quo. Uh, it needs to support significant or fundamental systems change is often how transformation is defined. Uh, yeah, it will require that we learn our way into 
places that, that have not yet been clearly understood. So this notion of social learning, learning together into something new. Uh, decolonization, uh, certainly uh, opening up new ways of, of seeing things, recognizing different groups that have often been marginalized. Yeah, social media playing an important role in this, uh, that it, it supports this ground up social inclusive response and that it is a response to a planetary emergency that we are trying to <clears throat> to respond and, and to support society, the realization of, of societal uh, development within the planetary boundaries uh, and a, a state that is yeah, probably most usefully characterized as a planetary emergency. Good. Well, that gives us a, a good sense of the kinds of, of interests and understandings that uh, that people bring, and hopefully we can build through the session today better well-being for all. The next session I'm going to to introduce uh, is really gives us an overview of uh, education for sustainable development, and uh, it uh, is with great pleasure really that I introduce Robert Donoghue. Professor Emeritus in the Environmental Learning Research Center at Rhodes University in South Africa. Rob has been a leader in the field of environmental education and education for sustainable development for over 50 years and shares some insights into the ESD 2030 framework to guide our deliberations. We're going to now launch uh, Rob's slides. Hello, my name is Robert Donoghue from the Environmental Learning Research Centre at Rhodes University. And in this presentation, I look at Education 2030, as it aims to build a more just and sustainable world by strengthening ESD to achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals through nationwide multi-stakeholder ESD initiatives in five priority action areas. Advancing policy, looking at learning environments and whole institution approaches, teachers and educators building their capacity, youth and engagement of youth, and also community as an important node. When you look at this, they're looking at um, individual transformation, social transformation and technological advances. When one looks at the entire um, strategy, there's a golden thread across these priority action areas, and that is sustainable lifestyle education as network processes of regenerative action learning with the sustainable development goals. Now, how do we activate learning led lifestyle change with the sustainable development goals? <clears throat> it's not easy. The competencies specified for teaching the sustainable development goals are not easy to mediate and evaluate in school and community contexts. The SDGs can also present as an abstract and complex agenda to be enacted in everyday social life, an outside in process rather than <clears throat> an inside out process um, in terms of action learning, and also a downloading of problems of complex problem solving interventions for citizens to engage with. <clears throat> so to overcome these challenges, the SDGs can be used as a toolkit for ethics led action learning towards regenerative lifestyle change. And in this case, I'll be drawing on the handprint care work that we've been doing. The sustainable development goals are not only a goal directed agenda, but can also be used as a toolkit for transforming learner led um, lifestyle change challenges in ESD as co-engaged regenerative processes of learning. If we take an example like water, a complex agenda of ethics led action learning, then the inclusion of indigenous heritage knowledge is really important because this informs us how the past has produced modern change and risk. Teachers also have content to teach like ecosystems and this can be taught in the way that pollution causes um, siltation, a decrease in light that affects the feeding of organisms and diminishes the functioning of an ecosystem. If we go a bit further then in this work with teachers, then learning-led lifestyle change challenges can be 
inclusive of work with the Sustainable Development Goals as a tool, where the matters of concern, the students working in a river in this case, are at the center. And here, the descriptions of their context, the work that they're doing, and the way that they relate this to lifestyles is really important for continuing work um, at a school level. And here, they might um, work with the SDGs as a tool that looks at water, um, education. But then in this group, they said, well, that's health and well being, and that's poverty. Um, that is a significant point. There are inequalities to be dealt with. <clears throat> there is gender. There are also peace and justice issues, along with the life and water that we're looking at to see how things have changed. And of course, there's climate change. So here what you've got is if you center on the matters of concern in a curriculum context, lifestyle can come through around the subject knowledge that teachers have to teach, the way that this can be taken into an inquiry, working with the SDG as an analytical tool, and then so also looking at life skills challenges. And of course, schools are connected to communities and community contexts of action learning networks for regenerative lifestyle livelihood transformations are another possibility. So it is possible to work with the sustainable development goals, but not in a goal directed way, often in a generative way at a local community level where it's possible to do things differently, positively and in relation to the lifestyle choices that we make. And here are some references that I used to um, develop this short presentation. Thank you very much, Rob, for, for sharing those ideas. Uh, yeah, and I, I think that this notion of, of a kind of locally led and locally embedded uh, education action is just absolutely key for this kind of work. In order to share examples of this, uh, the SLE has developed a short video uh, and it touches on many of the, the aspects that Rob has outlined and it will inform the panel discussion that follows. Let's queue up the video. Thanks. The Sustainable Lifestyles and Education Program of the One Planet Network aims to foster the uptake of sustainable lifestyles as the common norm. Through a global network of experts, practitioners, and learners, the program develops tools and resources that allow policymakers, businesses, and civil society to build sustainable systems of living. Over the past few years, we have developed and implemented projects in our aim to make sustainable lifestyles a focus in every learning environment. The global search for sustainable schools started in 2019 and supports teachers and students from more than 40 schools across nine countries. Despite the challenges of COVID-19, participating schools developed and implemented action plans and projects within school curriculums and extracurricular activities such as wetland and topsoil restoration and education campaigns around food, energy, water and waste. In the Philippines, school gardening programs were updated to become home garden programs, continuing much needed nutritional support to families and spreading knowledge about the ecological footprint of the food we eat. And in South Africa, water conservation programs adapted to the enhanced sanitation and hygiene protocols by implementing tippy taps to better control the water used during the pandemic. We've learned the critical value of schools as centers of community stability and support. Engaging students in the planning and implementation of projects creates a sense of ownership that enhances a sense of agency in charting their own sustainable living journey and seeing the local impact. Trust fund projects are on the ground projects that investigate and test pathways to sustainable living. In Solak, a rural community in Armenia, the overdependence on imported natural gas puts a heavy financial burden on farmers' households. An NGO called Armenian Women for Health and Healthy Environment, in collaboration with a few universities, including the University of Chile, 
sought to introduce clean energy solutions along the agri-food chains. For example, solar-powered water pumps to irrigate lentils and other climate-resilient crops. The project also introduced online courses and field activities, such as training for students and business model support for farmers. While working in Armenia, and indeed in all of our 24 Trust Fund project locations, we have learned that sustainable ways of living reduces negative impacts from our lives, such as resource use and GHG emissions. It also paves the way for reliable livelihoods, enabling people to live through the shocks and pressures from environment, society and economy, such as COVID-19. People can identify local opportunities by addressing their concerns and enabling more sustainable ways of living, including identifying local natural resources that are not yet fully utilized. Our third project has been to create the Good Life Goals in association with the creative change agency, Futera. This is essentially a toolkit that outlines a set of tangible actions linking individual lifestyles with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. The Good Life Goals lay out specific ways anyone can contribute towards the huge, planet-changing objectives that sit at the heart of the SDG agenda. We worked with Danon, a global food company, which holds the world's largest football tournament for 10 to 12-year-olds yearly. They have encouraged youth to learn and interact with the Good Life Goals, voting on which goal they had as a favorite. In 2019, the winners were Goal 1, help and poverty. Goal five, treat everyone equally. And goal 13, act on climate. Using the Good Life Goals allowed Danon to get a global picture of kids' expectations regarding tomorrow's world. Sustainability won't be solved by institutions without individuals. Another project that highlights what individuals can do is Anatomy of Action. UNEP developed the Anatomy of Action Toolkit with the UN School of Disruptive Design in 2016. It outlines five areas of individual change people can make to support the growing shift to global sustainability. Represented by your five fingers. Food, stuff, move, money, and fun. Food. Did you know that if everybody eliminates meat and dairy from their diet, there could be a 49% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from food production and a 76% reduction in land used for food production. So if everyone cuts down on their meat and dairy consumption, we would come a long way. Since 2019, SLE has supported the Anatomy of Action to create a global social media challenge from Latin America and the Caribbean to Ghana, India, France, and the Baltic region. The goal is to reach 20 million youth by 2022. Today, we've looked at just a snapshot of the exciting projects the SLE program has undertaken. But the Sustainable Lifestyles Education Hub, launched in spring 2021, showcases all the projects and resources, as well as policy guidance, teaching materials, case studies, and practical solutions for education for sustainable lifestyles. We encourage visitors not only to share and use these resources, but also contribute to the hub with material from around the globe. Please also visit the One Planet Network for more information about the SLE program and the vital work we do. Sure. At a, at a time when so many of us are feeling the, the pressures of global challenges, uh, it's really inspiring to see the kinds of activities that are being undertaken all over the world. Uh, and a real pleasure to spend some time uh, with, and with a panel, many of whom, in fact, all of whom have been involved with some of the work that was shared in that video. So in the panel, uh, we have uh, Socorro Patendol, who is a sustainability specialist at the Philippine Center for Environmental Awareness and Sustainability, and who has been instrumental in the success of the global search for sustainable schools in the Philippines. We also have Bridget Ringdahl, who heads up the International Water Explorer Program in South Africa, and has supported the global search for sustainable schools in South Africa, Namibia, and Uganda. Gohar Kojayan, 
uh, is a communication specialist with the Armenian Women for Health and Healthy Environment and was involved in the implementation of one of the SLE Trust Fund projects that we've just seen in the video. Boris Montanger uh, is a program officer with the United Nations Environment Program and he has supported the SLE with a particular interest in mobilizing social media for change. So just to open up to the panel uh, and open up to some discussion, maybe the first question to, to Socorro. I think that it's evident from the video that the parents and the communities are more actively involved in the whole educational process now than before, now than, than they have been before, particularly with the COVID. And the question really is what school policies were changed and what methods were employed to support learning on sustainable lifestyles and sustainable development? Over to you, Socorro. Socorro, you might be on mute. I am aware that Socorro was having some uh, difficulty with, with connecting earlier on. Uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll move over to, to Bridget and then as soon as uh, Socorro is, is available, we'll repose the question. So Bridget, you were also involved in the global search for sustainable schools. Uh, and one of the considerations for real transformation is that it necessitates people yes. opting to... Uh, good evening. Good evening from... So Yes. Sakura. Right, Sakura, we can hear you. Try. Yes. Sakura, I'm going to come back to you uh, if that's okay. It's just that the, the connection is, is not great. Uh, so back over to Bridget. Uh, you mentioned that, that one of the considerations for real transformation is that it necessitates that people opting to step outside of the safety of the status quo. And I was just wondering how you were able to engage learners and teachers in this kind of disruptive uh, and life-changing engagement. Over to you, Bridget. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, this is, it's, it's tough as it's really difficult to measure lifestyle changes, but we feel that learners and teachers need to know and understand that environmental challenges don't exist in isolation and they are systemic and that they too are part of that system. We also find that there are gaps in teachers and therefore learners knowledge around certain issues. Take the example of climate change. People tend to think that climate change is an external issue to do with pollution and factories rather than lifestyle and consumer choices. Therefore, uh, we ensure that we share information that is correct. And then through our, our in-classroom co-teaching and the different methods we use, we unravel and engage teachers and learners in understanding more about the issue. So it's through the knowing and understanding the why we have found that it can become compelling and therefore can translate into this transformation you talk about. For an example, uh, one of the most powerful things anyone can do to reduce their personal carbon or water footprint is through food choices. Uh, for many, uh, food is an emotional subject and diets are culturally entrenched. Many feel uncomfortable. They don't like knowing they should be eating less animal products, for example. But this, together with the stress of the COVID crisis, actually provided us with this wonderful opportunity to introduce disruption that you speak about for more than one reason, and to reevaluate food choices for both our health and the planet. Through the, through the COVID and Healthy Planet workshops we ran for teachers, new ideas around what is considered good nutrition in relation to the virus and the impacts that a heavy animal product diet has on our overall health and immune systems, and more critically, the planet, planet was introduced. Most participants um, were shocked actually to find out that viruses like COVID arise from animal exploitation and how a heavy saturated fats diet, in other words, animal diet, equates to a greater chance of getting diabetes and heart disease. And in South Africa, that's the number one cause for mortality and is also a strong comorbidity in the COVID pandemic. 
So it, it's comments like this that I'll read to you now from some of the teachers we inter interacted with and certainly wasn't the only one where this teacher, Mrs. McKee says, it's so simple to eat plant-based and you can take better control over your immunity and lifestyle diseases. I know many friends and family members who have diabetes um, and heart conditions. And when I look at their diet, I can understand why. We really need to be te teaching children this new sustainable nutrition. In my family, my youngest daughter doesn't like meat. It's me who likes it and needs to change. Sometimes the older people are the ones more resistant to change, but I'm going to do things differently from now on and incorporate local vegetables and emifinos, which are traditional foods, in our meatless meals. So there's an example of disruption and transformation. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Bridget. And it certainly is a big area of, of challenge for all of us to think about uh, deeply embedded ideas uh, like what we eat. Uh, I'm going to move now to, to Gohar and, uh, and us and Gohar supported, as I mentioned, one of the trust fund projects. And the question really is, did the engagement of university students in finding clean energy solutions help trigger transformative action by rural community members in Armenia? Over to you, Gohar. Thank you very much for the question and greetings from Armenia. Uh, Armenian Women for Health and Healthy Environment uh, and Energy Sec uh, Center of the University of Chile and two universities in Armenia, Agricultural University and Polytechnic University, collaborated on the project of encouraging young specialists to power the agri-food value chains. And this project is a direct response uh, to Armenians over dependence on imported fuel, uh, which creates security of supply risks as well as affordability problems for farmers. The pilot rural community that we selected, uh, which is named Solak, and, uh, before the project used solar energy in agriculture only for traditional fruit drying. Now, as a women's organization, we strongly believe that if empowered to use renewable energy, rural community women could have a stronger capacity to lead the sustainable transformations. In the select community, we cooperated, for instance, with the local uh, women's resource center. They helped us identify and train community actors. Uh, on the other hand, when we dealt with the uh, uh, university students, the level of enrollment of young women in universities is high in Armenia, but the project's academic course encouraged female students to join educational programs offered by the traditionally male-dominated energy faculties. However, due to the COVID-19 situation, pandemic, the universities and the public community were under lockdown for uh, some uh, periods of time. In response, online options were put into practice. And also, for example, we organized web-based business model training for farmers. And there we included messages uh, on personal hygiene for the farmers and their families. As a result of the project, the students engaged with the community, uh, with the activists that we trained, empowering local uh, water pumps with solar panels for irrigation of endemic land and other high value uh, climate resilient crops. A total of 10 hectares of irrigated land was used for growing grain and uh, 11 farmers benefited from it. Thanks to a new closed irrigation system, the loss of water is minimized it down to 15% from the original 45. And installation of solar panels resulted in reduction of carbon dioxide emissions by almost 14 tons. The farmers used a mobile application to monitor the energy production and they noted uh, electricity savings with uh, really great satisfaction. The education partnership expanded in, uh, further and we engaged the private sector as well solar energy companies and we are particularly proud that we, had, uh, we were able to have an important cooperation with the uh, local water use association. So I think we did have a strong transformation in the community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Goha. And uh, I will say that, that since uh, interacting with you and, and the team and some of the work that you were doing, uh, we've, we've put solar power onto our house uh, and, and run completely off the grid. So uh, 
so these these things do inspire and uh, and help to support uh, more action, I suppose. Boris, I'm going to move over to you and just uh, yeah, comment really around uh, now that amongst the youth in particular, social media has become a central source of information and knowledge outside of the classroom. It's particularly evident uh, in times of, of COVID when so many of us are working away from formal institutions. I suppose the question is, is what is there to learn from this shift to social media for educators and for policy makers? Over to you, Boris. Thanks, Mike, and uh, hello, everyone. So, yeah, uh, first, like as a matter of fact, these days, youth uses the Internet a lot uh, and social media represent like fair share um, of the use of the Internet is about in OECD countries, 90% of the 18, 24 being on social media. Um, youth gets most of their news through social media, meaning um, through what they choose to follow. So it's very much their choice, right? Um, news pages, topical pages, influencers, for example. Um, so this is like a first point. Then um, we also need to acknowledge that embracing um, a given lifestyle, hopefully a sustainable one, is driven partly by knowledge, but mainly by our social norms, values, aspirations, and must be presented as an opportunity to live better rather than as it maybe too often is um, as like a set of restrictions and limitations in a way. So considering these two simple points, it seems very relevant and crucial for like successful education on sustainable um, lifestyle to find ways to mix educative with aspirational content while getting inspired by how um, social media functions to structure and democratize social tools, these tools. Um, so with this in mind, I want to tell you a little bit more about the practical example that was presented earlier in the video. Um, so it uses social media to educate and inspire youth. It's called the Atomy of Action. It's been developed by UNEP and UNSCHOOL School in uh, 2016. Um, it's both a science-based framework to understand sustainable lifestyles around five domains, food stuff, move, money and fun. And it's also a social media challenge which invites youth to inspire each other um, by providing factual contents and at the same time the space for fun, creativity and inspirations. Now, to dig in a little bit further, an interesting example that may give ideas to um, educators or policy makers um, on how to connect social media to a broader education framework is to look um, at how is Regeneration 2030 using the anatomy of action. So Regeneration 2030 is a youth group that operates in the Nordic and Baltic Sea region and that, um, and that focusing on SDG 12, sustainable consumption and production. So um, later, like soon actually, like next week from May 24th to June 7th, <clears throat> they will run an AOA challenge um, and then bring the outcomes of the challenge and aspiration expressed throughout the challenge in their actual events, the Regeneration Week, which will take place at the end of August. Um, so I think there is a lot to learn from this process in which Regeneration 2030 uses social media to kickstart a project to raise interest about sustainable lifestyle in a fun and interactive way um, in order to then get the thinking and discussion going at an event or in a classroom for that matter. So living sustainably being more than um, being more about aspiring um, than learning as such, another approach beyond teaching sustainable lifestyle um, could be about creating the interest for the youth to learn more about sustainable lifestyle by themselves um, through what they follow on social media, for example, which are activities which, which um, they would then naturally undertake by themselves and outside of the classroom. Uh, so to conclude, I would like to say that social media, um, using one way or another, as shown here, um, can be an important tool as part of the disruptive solutions needed to get youth to live lighter and better. Thank you. Boris, thank you very, very much for those insights. Uh, and yeah, I think social media as a, as a tool has really exploded with uh, 
with the COVID pandemic uh, and just being used in so many creative ways, including, in fact, this this kind of conference. So, uh, so welcome to again to everybody who's joined us and uh, and being part of it. We're going to try and get uh, uh, Mr. Socorro back. Uh, there's no guarantee, of course, on on how social media works sometimes, but uh, but let's let's have a go. So, I'm I'm re really hoping that you can hear us and just. A quick question around the kinds of school policies uh, that were changed and what methods were employed to support learning on sustainable lifestyles and sustainable development during your uh, global schools for uh, global search for sustainable schools project. Over to you. Yes, good evening everyone. The Philippines Department of Education has embarked on the formulation and adoption of the basic education learning continuity plan to allow learners from kinder to grade 12 to continue learning while COVID-19 remains. The GSS Philippines participating schools comply with the DEP and plan. The system to deliver instruction and assess learnings are incorporated in the design of the modules where sustainable development, specifically sustainable consumption and production concepts and practices are integrated. The process includes synchronous sessions which involve the direct instruction from the teacher in a virtual classroom and a synchronous session which are independent reading and learning of the students with very minimal interaction with the teacher. And this is where parents and community stakeholders are involved. Teachers motivate parents and community leaders to teach and assist the children in asynchronous sections. Expected learnings are assessed through written online exercises, quizzes and exams, and submitted outputs like videos and images of their performance tasks. To assess students' learnings on SD and SL, forms are sent which include questions about their home gardens, waste management, water and electricity consumption, and savings, health and lifestyle practices in what we call the integrative assessment. However, teachers found monitoring to be difficult because there is a very little means of verifying that the methods indeed affect on the students' learnings when they are doing their assessments. It has now become a common practice that parents are helping and assisting their children to do their modules. In some cases, community stakeholders do the same for students who approach them. So teachers have accepted the fact that this is the result of home study program and that parents and community leaders are indeed involved in teaching the, the children. So while there is no assurance that the students have gained 100% that desired learning, sustainable development, and sustainable lifestyle, we are certain that these learnings are influencing the parents and creating sustainability results in family and communities. Thank you. Mr. Cora, I'm so glad that you could join us and that we didn't miss that. So uh, much appreciated. And to the to the whole panel for, for their many insights. We have an opportunity now to open up for some uh, some questions, uh, and and yeah, for a chance for the panel to to offer some responses. So maybe a, a first question from Maya, and and it's really, uh, I think Boris, you're probably best placed to to answer this one. And the question is, can we freely adopt, adapt, and localize the good life goals? Um, if we can uh, adapt and localize the good life goals, um, I'm not extremely familiar with the good life goals themselves, um, but I think it is extremely important to, to do so indeed. And with the Antonio faction, we are like now um, having like similar questions that arise, like this um, toolkit and like this framework in which, through which we like think of sustainable lifestyles and look at where we can have the maximum impact needs to be adapted from one um, context to another um, and if we go um, in, in a developed country let's say or in a developing economy it's like different actions also how is the energy produced is like different 
what people have access to and therefore where is their largest footprint is different. So it needs to be, uh, it is very important actually to, to kind of like tune this by region. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, if, if I can come in, hi everyone, my name is program and the, the good life goals um, they can be um, they can be translated into any language uh, there are very crisp and and clear actions uh, that have been developed and those can be translated um, the emojis and the way they look are, are the same uh, everywhere but the context and how you can use the good life goals can be um, can be uh, used in so many different ways whether it be activity centers, whether it be outside uh, communication um, activities or parks. It, there's so many different ways that, that these good life goals can be used. Um, so if uh, if at the end um, there or in the in the booth in the contact section, um, there's an email to to me, Andrea Norgren. Uh, just drop me a line and um, we can discuss um, opportunities. Thank you. Right. And thank you both to Boris and Andrea for jumping in. Andrea, great to see a cameo performance uh, in the in the session uh, and to have your, your input and, and insight. Uh, I think that, that all of this ESD is going to require quite a lot of adaptation uh, and, and suiting it to local context. So thank you for, for those insights into how that can be done. What a question for, for perhaps uh, Bridget uh, and Mrs. Socorro. Around the um, the global search for sustainable schools and its link uh, to social media as a tool, and just a, a sense of how social media may have supported the spread of lessons on uh, sustainable lifestyles. I'll open it up first to to Bridget and then to Socorro. Uh, hi, Mike. Yeah, I think um, we represent probably uh, uh, probably most of the planet. In fact, in terms of the learners. Um, that they actually don't have um, access to these social media platforms. So sort of mm -hmm. Europe and North America, um, you know, th th that kind of tool is really great and a good way of sharing lessons. But for us, um, really, we have a Facebook presence and that's it. And <clears throat> we, we showcase our stuff on social media. But, um, you know, the people that see it is very few and far between. And certainly um, our participants who are teachers and learners aren't generally on those platforms. So it's, you know, it, it does have its limitations. So I think for, we, we, it's, it's a wonderful tool, but as you said, we have to be contextual about these things um, mm -hmm. and really, you know, strive for that, but um, be realistic as well mm. in the yeah. particular context, yeah. Super, thanks Bridget. So Cora, I wonder whether you had a thought uh, in terms of the, the sustainable schools work on social media. So the social media help a lot in uh, disseminating the activities of the schools, exchanging information, especially during the time when Philippines was under the strict um, quarantine and uh, people are not allowed to go out of their house and uh, still they continue to work, they continue to study and the social media is uh, the best tool for the teachers to reach out to the students and for the students to exchange information with classmates and with the, the teachers as well. Parents are also very much involved and the social media served also as their platform to communicate with the community, co-teach the teachers and co-parents as well. That's very important. That's why uh, the Philippines we spend a lot of money for social media. Thank you, Mike. Thank you to both Bridget and Sakura. And I think just highlighting again the, the, the need for creativity, uh, the need for kind of new development, uh, new ways of doing things uh, that are reflected in the very, very different contexts that we see across uh, different spaces and the different kinds of issues uh, that both learners uh, and educators face in, in seeking to address sustainable development challenges and sustainable lifestyles, uh, education work. But uh, a question for, for Gohar in, in this one, with regard to technology and the internet and its role in ESD, what thoughts do you have with regard, regards to, to people uh, who don't have access to the internet? So we've spoken a little bit about the social media, obviously one aspect, but, uh, but the other aspect is, is uh, access to knowledge, 
uh, networks that are, are shared over the over the internet. What are your, your thoughts on how to open those up or to make them more effective in supporting sustainable lifestyle education? Yeah, thank you. Uh, in fact, uh, we don't need to uh, think of things ourselves. Ask the young people. We would like you to work with the university students and we ask them how you want to have your information shared. This is the name of our project. Now they are reading the name of the project and it's long. They say, no, we don't like this name of the project. We are called Green Rangers of Armenia. They opened a closed Facebook group and finished. We lost control of it. They started exchanging things, ideas, putting the presentation. It worked perfectly well. But just uh, be on the guard. I uh, want to warn you that, of course, uh, we uh, unfortunately lost a couple of very good students who live uh, far away from the capital and in remote villages who were not able to follow uh, the course, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, because of the poor internet, because of uh, poverty in general. So it, it's not so all wonderful. We have to think of ways and I'm very happy to say that the uh, participants, the students or whoever, the constituency, they can come up with ways of helping themselves to uh, reaching out. Uh, so this is also one of the strengths of this uh, sustainable education approaches that we had in the communities. Thank you. Oh, thank you for that reminder to to acknowledge many different groups, including including the youth as key role players in this work. Boris, I'm going to hand over to you for a final comment from from the panel, particularly around this uh, notion of, of access to the Internet and the role that the Internet can play in supporting sustainable lifestyles education. Yes, so in, indeed, like this lack of access to Internet when like we start using social media as a way to convey idea to like inspire each other and all. Uh, it is limitating, of course, um, but yet the people that we want to target are the people who do have a larger footprint, I would say, the people who are living in cities, um, the people who do have, in fact, access to social media and in the internet in general. Um, so, yeah, we cannot reach everyone, but, um, you know, it's the same, 80% yeah, of greenhouse gases are uh, emitted by the G20, by the 20th uh, most developed countries in the world. This is a way of like targeting people. Um, if you go to any country, the, the more people money have, all of them are on the internet and social media and the more uh, environmental impact, either be it on climate and biodiversity and pollution they have. Um, so yeah, I think to target the people that we want, those who have the most impact on the planet, they, these are the ones who are on social media. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Boris. And this uh, this notion of, of both uh, yeah, finding ways of getting messages out and then, of course, finding ways of inviting people to, to contribute uh, and the support that the internet can offer to that. So with that, I'd like to say a, a very, very big thank you to uh, our panel, Socorro, Bridget, Gohar, uh, Boris, and to the introductory comments uh, by Rob. And, and not only for the contribution to this panel, for the enormous contribution that, that all of our panel make to ongoing education for sustainable development uh, and education that supports sustainable lifestyles. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Bimlinda Jha, who is going to make some uh, summary of some of uh, the key insights that we've, we've uh, heard over the last hour or so, and then also make some closing remarks and point to some ways forward. Over to you, Vim. Uh, thank you, Mike. I think it was, it was a very interesting and diverse kind of a conversation, uh, starting from the responses that we actually got on the Mentimeter, which talked about, you know, uh, disruption. It, it, it spoke about decolonizing our education. It also spoke about how we need to really talk about new culture in education or perhaps new culture in sustainability itself. So it was it was a very interesting beginning to this panel discussion. Uh, also, Robert uh, spoke about the roadmap as in how outside the intervention uh, for inside out education process is very, very critical. So it's not just about inside out. It's also to understand outside in how do we need to really get system and processes from outside to uh, to our entire system. I think it's very, very important for us at this juncture 
to uh, before we uh, we talk about the panelists and uh, the thoughts that they shared to look at uh, the ESG for 2030 roadmap and the four areas that it actually talks about as in, uh, and that's the focus because we're talking about transformative learning and change. We're not talking about learning, which is which which is just establishing status quo, which is just uh, you know continues what we've been doing for the last 50 or 100, 200 years, but somewhere it disrupts. So I think the roadmap itself, that uh, uh, the roadmap document itself plans or, or designs for that sort of a disruption in four different ways uh, or four different areas, I would say, uh, and which is actually a balance between uh, practice and policy. Uh, one, with regard to pedagogy and learning environment. Uh, second, to understand learning content in terms of you know, how do we integrate sustainability issues uh, you know, that are mentioned in SDGs, uh, learning outcomes, and also societal transformation as into how do we actually enable the achievement of SDGs. And, and in some of the conversation that perhaps the panelists have had, they've talked about how a lot of issues of environment or of environment and education or of sustainability is not restricted to one SDG. It's actually linked to poverty, it's linked to food, it's linked to gender, it's linked to peace and justice. So every time we talk about sustainability or every time we talk about sustainability based education or sustainable education or, or education for sustainable development, we're actually talking about almost all the SDGs in that sense. Uh, you know, we've had uh, Bridget talk about real transformation, real change and disruption. Uh, you know, it's, uh, she, she was talking about how it's difficult to assess lifestyle changes because, you know, at the end of the day, you can't put a CCTV in somebody's bathroom to find out whether they waste water or not. So a lot of lifestyle changes or lifestyle adaptation or value system that we're talking about has to be self-driven or even the assessment has to be self-assessment in many, many ways. Uh, you know, uh, Bridget's response uh, that she talked about uh, with regard to current context of COVID and what we grow and what we eat is extremely, extremely critical. Uh, you know, it's not just a virus, but it's virus how it interacts with us or how it interacts with our body. And, you know, I, I just want to, you know, I'm, I live in Delhi and I know that every time we, uh, we talk about COVID, we talk about how uh, COVID affects the respiratory system. Delhi being the you know the worst uh, or the most polluted capital uh, in the world, it surely is showing up in its numbers and its uh, you know COVID casualties. So we need to really look at what we eat, what we uh, what we grow, what we breathe throughout the year to understand this COVID context. It just cannot be virus alone. 80% perhaps virus or perhaps 70% or less virus, a lot of it is to do with our lifestyle in that sense. Uh, very interestingly, Gohar uh, uh, spoke about the case study of Armenia where young people are taking control. Young people are actually looking at transformation with, with respect to energy. And I think that's very, very important that in many parts of the world, I'm not sure about Armenia, but in other parts of the world, when the state fails, when the government or the system uh, completely collapses, it's the young people who have taken control over sustainability or sustainable education or sustainable practices or the ownership of sustainability based governance and have shown us the way. So it's very important for us to really empower uh, young people and to celebrate those stories of change that we are actually getting from, from Armenia. Uh, you know, go, go also. Uh, spoke about power to the people. It's important. We in democracy does not mean power to of the elected or power to the elected. Uh, it's it's actually about young people as well. Uh, Boris uh, interestingly spoke about internet. Interestingly spoke about uh, social media. Uh, yes, it indeed has had uh, uh, you know educators all around the world. But one critical question that perhaps. Uh, Boris also tried to answer right now that there is something called a digital divide. There is social media which is very powerful. You and I, all of us use it. But how do we actually look at, uh, you know, uh, bridging that digital divide? Uh, 
I think this is broadly what, what this session was about. It was interesting. It was about diversity, diversity in practice, diversity in context. I think this also brings me uh, to my final point that I want to actually share with you with regard to our education hub. Uh, you know, the team yeah. that we actually have here uh, has actually, uh, you know, created a sustainable lifestyle education hub which is almost like a one-stop shop, which is almost like a one place where educators, practitioners, and learners together share uh, their resources. And I think uh, the slide is there. Uh, it, it actually provides visitors a space to browse through five different types of resources, learning resources, policy guidance, te teaching material, case study, everything uh, that we perhaps need, uh, everything that not just we as people who actually have something to do with policy or education, but people on the ground really require. So we're very, very happy. And I think the entire team uh, of Robert, uh, Andrea, Ina, Mike, Victoria, everyone who's worked on this. So it's amazing. And, and we actually have very, very soon a webinar to launch this. In fact, you can actually, there's a barcode there that you can actually scan and get an invitation uh, uh, you know, sign up for our newsletter and also be informed about this launch date of the best so-called web website or hub that we're trying to create for educationists, practitioners, learners, policymakers on education. Thank you, Mike. It was, I think, amazing to capture a range of issues from food to energy to internet and young people at the center of, of all of this. Thanks a lot, everyone, for participating for this beautiful, wonderful, panel discussion and this webinar. Good. <clears throat> thank you Vim for summing it all up and thank you all for participating.